Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Ash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. George Koo, who is an internationally recognized expert on alcohol and stress and the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction. He is the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, where he provides leadership in the national effort to reduce the public health burden associated with alcohol misuse. As NIAAA director, Dr. Koob oversees a broad portfolio of alcohol research ranging from basic science to epidemiology, diagnostics, prevention, and treatment. Dr. Koob earned his doctorate in behavioral physiology from Johns Hopkins University in 1972. Prior to taking the helm at NIAAA, he served as a professor and chair of the Scripps Committee on the Neurobiology of Addictive Disorders and director of the Alcohol Research Center at the Scripps Research Institute. Dr. Koob is the recipient of many prestigious awards and honors for his research, mentorship, and international scientific collaboration. Dr. Koob has authored more than 650 peer-reviewed scientific papers and a co-author of The Neurobiology of Addiction, a comprehensive textbook reviewing the most critical neurobiology of addiction research conducted over the past 50 years. Dr. Koob, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led you to your research in the field of the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction? I like to say that I started my career trying to understand how we feel good, and I'm ending my career trying to understand how we feel bad. So I started as an undergraduate at Penn State in zoology. I was fascinated with animal behavior, and I went to Johns Hopkins, and I was involved in a number of projects, one with mice and their social behavior, but another on brain stimulation reward in rats. And if you've ever seen a rat press a lever 100 times a minute, to stimulate its own brain, you're hooked, pun intended. And so I became really interested in the brain reward system, and the rest is kind of history. We spent a good bit of time trying to understand how drugs of abuse are rewarding and pleasurable. And then somewhere mid-career, I had one of those scientific eureka moments when I realized that there was another part to the story, which is that the drugs first activated your reward system, and then, in a sense, they destroyed it. That's kind of where we're at today. That's how I got involved. I might add that I had some spectacularly great mentors all along the way as an undergraduate in graduate school and in my later career, individuals with whom I had many interactions, never really published papers with many of them, like Joe Brady at Hopkins and Saul Snyder at Hopkins, and then Floyd Bloom, who was my boss for 40 years at the Scripps Research Institute. And all of these individuals were wonderful people who were very generous. And so I've tried to do the same in my career. When and how did you realize that focusing on the neurobiology of addiction would be important in reducing the personal suffering and the public health burden? associated with the misuse of alcohol and drugs? I think early on, the hypothesis we worked under is if we could understand how the drugs work, we could find ways to block them. And that's one of the more simplistic views. But then we realized that the drugs change your brain. And then the major hypothesis is if the drugs change your brain, how do we get your brain back to where it was? And I think that's where we're at today. Most of the work in the neurobiology of addiction now is focused on trying to understand what neural circuits go awry and how you can tweak them back into an at least normal state or close to normal state and get on with your life. So how would you briefly explain the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction to a non-professional? Basically, drugs are unusual in that they tap into these reward systems I was talking about in a very, very powerful way that even the most powerful reward that you get in everyday life pales in comparison. And so drugs like the psychostimulants or opiates or even alcohol make the reward system very happy initially. But unfortunately, as I often told undergraduates, there's no free ride in the brain. So when you use a drug that's tapping into the reward system, the drug basically takes over, the word that's been used a lot is usurps the reward system, takes over the reward system, and runs it into the ground. And so what happens is 
you could think of it as depleting neurotransmitters like endorphins or dopamine, or you can think of it in terms of receptor changes that become tolerant to the repetitive bombardment of your pleasure system. There are many ways to think about how you lose your reward system. But in the end, individuals who become addicted no longer feel good, particularly when they're not taking the drug. And then there's another insidious part that I certainly had a hand in with my own research, and that is while you're losing your reward system, you gain your stress system. And most relapses in addiction are caused under situations of feeling bad or negative emotional states or stress. And so we didn't know it back then, but we now know there are brain circuits involved in fight or flight that are critical for our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and crossing the road in Washington, D.C., like I do every day. And that fight or flight system that either freezes you or causes you to run out of the way of impending danger. But when you take drugs and you stop taking the drugs, this fight or flight system is fully engaged. And so you have this double whammy, I call it, which is you lose your pleasure system, you gain your stress system. And if that wasn't enough, you also, with many drugs, impair the functioning of your executive function system, the part of your brain, the front end of your brain, the cortex that we as humans have so highly developed, it helps us make decisions and withhold responding and wait for bigger rewards instead of littler rewards. And all these kind of things where we make decisions, but this decision system gets impaired either by the repetitive binging and withdrawing or by direct effects of the drug on some of these uh, neurotransmitter systems. Or, sad to say, many other elements in life, developmental issues such as being abused as a child or trauma as a child, can influence the same executive function system. And so you have three really major effects on the brain in addiction. One is you have an overactive reward system initially, followed by loss of reward and increased stress. And you have an executive decision-making system that's gone awry. Can you explain the three stages of addiction? Well, the three stages fall into those three domains. What I've described to you are three functional domains. The first is called the binge intoxication stage, and that's where you get high. But there's a second part to that high, which is that it releases dopamine and opioid peptides, and they become linked to stimuli in the environment that are normally neutral. But now those stimuli, it could be a white powder if it's cocaine, it could be a favorite beverage if it's alcohol, come to elicit a craving for the drug. And that system also then triggers your habit system. And so early on in the binge intoxication stage, you have this facilitation of anticipation and craving for drugs, but you also have the formation of habits to obtain the drugs. The withdrawal negative affect stage, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. You're just basically miserable. You don't have your favorite drug. It's manifested in all kinds of miserable feelings, such as dysphoria, irritability, sleep problems, increased pain, increased emotional pain, and any description of an individual with addiction usually has a pretty good description of this dysphoric state, and that's the withdrawal negative affect stage. And then the preoccupation anticipation stage is the executive function system that becomes out of functioning and, and, and not functioning properly. So you tend to be impulsive, you respond very quickly in making decisions, often the wrong ones. You go for immediate reinforcers and as opposed to delayed reinforcers. Part of that is loss of function in the frontal cortex, and part of it is also residual habits that are ingrained from the binge intoxication stage. So this combination of craving plus impaired ability to inhibit the craving leads to what we call a kind of go-and-stop system dysfunction and executive behavior. Can you give a brief overview of the difference between alcohol and drug addiction in terms of neurobiology? Almost all the drugs of abuse, except for alcohol, have a specific receptor that they either bind to or they activate a neurotransmitter like cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine and then dopamine binds to a neurotransmitter receptor. Alcohol is the exception in the sense there is no alcohol receptor. But what we're learning is that there are alcohol receptive elements that are probably 
parts of ion channels that are embedded in membranes that may be, it's a big word, allosterically modulating the function of those channels. So in a sense, there are drugs that don't bind directly to a receptor, but they modulate the receptor indirectly. And that's what we mean by allosteric. Alcohol indirectly activates a lot of the transmitter systems that make you feel good and a lot of the stress system, I might add. And so alcohol is everywhere. It passes through all membranes. It gets everywhere in the brain, and it has a myriad of actions. You could think of it as the drug of abuse that hits all the targets. That's the way I would make the distinction. Whereas opiates are going to bind selectively to the opioid receptor, And like I said, psychostimulants work primarily through monoamines, primarily also dopamine. You know, you can go down, and nicotine works through the nicotinic receptor. So you can go down the list and find there's a very selective action for all these individual drugs, but alcohol hits all the targets. And, you know, some drugs, you enter through different stages of the addiction cycle. Alcohol, as a drug of abuse, has, as a substance of abuse, is a better way of putting it, perhaps, alcohol. You can start with binging, or you could start from the, in a sense, from the withdrawal negative affect stage because you simply are self medicating some mental health condition or social phobia or something of that nature. Or with alcohol, you could even start to the preoccupation, anticipation, craving stage in the sense that perhaps you were abused as a child. And so your inhibitory systems in executive function just aren't working very well. So you're much more likely to drink and drink to excess. Does that make alcohol worse? Does it make it a worse drug of abuse? Well, it depends on what metric you're using. When it comes to the cost of society, yes, alcohol is the second worst drug of abuse, with nicotine being the first because the cost of society is something like $254 billion, and I think it's more for tobacco. But alcohol in numbers alone, there are 14 to 15 million individuals with an alcohol use disorder Compare that to opiate use disorder, there are only 2 million. Now, only 2 million is not trivial, but 14 million is a lot bigger than 2 million. So, yeah, alcohol is a very pervasive and persuasive problem in American society. And to some extent, I always say it's alcohol is the addiction everybody knows about, but nobody wants to talk about. So, why is dopamine considered a key element of addiction? Well, dopamine has this incentive salience action that I was talking about. In other words, dopamine is a very powerful transmitter for getting on in the world in normal behavior because when anything is linked to a pleasurable effect, it gains motivational properties. So it could be a smell that you associate with your first date, for example, even the meal that you had with your first date or the place where you had your first date. And that becomes linked up through the release of dopamine. So when you return to that place, maybe it's the same restaurant, just have my wedding anniversary, you go back to the same restaurant, you get a little rush release of dopamine. It's very conserved kind of transmitter, even bumblebees, I think they have octopamine. And so when they see a flower and they get a release of octopamine, then that same flower releases octopamine the next time and they go back to the flower. That's why it's, uh, this, of course, has intrigued researchers for a long period of time trying to understand how dopamine conveys this motivational property. But it's not the only reward transmitter. I mean, opioid peptides or endorphins, as they're often called, are also very powerful because they bind to the opiate receptors and they make you feel good, warm and fuzzy, and they reduce pain and they produce euphoria. So dopamine has this motivational component that's been studied quite a bit and is common to all drugs of abuse. How do the changes in the brain from repeated substance use lead to long-term vulnerability to relapse? I kind of described that earlier. So the two major changes that occur, well, three major changes, are the the dopamine release and the preoccupation anticipation stage has triggered a sequence of circuits that engage habits. So brushing your teeth is a habit, but somehow magically appearing at the same bar, even when you didn't intend to, is another habit. One you can consider a good habit and one you consider a bad habit. But that's one of the first changes in your brain. Your habit systems are engaged very strongly because of the actions of drugs of abuse and particularly with alcohol. Second, when you stop taking your drug, you go through what I said, the withdrawal negative affect stage. So drugs 
initially make you feel good, but later they make you feel really bad. And that really bad feeling is a strong motivator for reseeking drugs of abuse. Now, it's not always obvious. You know, I don't believe individuals with an alcohol use disorder take alcohol because they have tremor. Many of them do have tremor if they have a very serious problem. They basically take alcohol. Tremor warns them that withdrawal is coming on and they're going to be miserable if they don't drink. So they begin taking alcohol to fix the problem that alcohol caused. And then the third piece is that your compromised frontal cortex decision-making system makes you very vulnerable to relapse. Cues come in and they trigger a return to drinking in the case of alcohol. And again, sometimes those they're not obvious cues. They could be things that you can't even cognitively recognize. And you hear people say that, you know, they've been sober for 15 years, and then suddenly it's often a combination of things. They lose their job, they lose their house, they may lose a spouse, but then some almost unconscious factor kicks in or cue that you're not aware of, and suddenly they're back drinking. And, you know, some of the neurons that we kill with high doses of alcohol, and we do kill neurons in the frontal cortex if we're really in the moderate to severe alcohol use disorder range, some of those neurons never grow back. And so you train up other systems, much like you would train up muscles around your knee if you've torn your anterior cruciate, but you still want to ski. Another way I put it is that if you're on the West Coast, it's Highway 5. If it's on the East Coast, it's Highway 95. But getting from Washington to New York, the simplest way is to go straight up the highway. But if the highway is blocked or it's not working very well, you can take the side roads. And so recovery is often the case of strengthening your way through the side roads, but it leaves you with a residual vulnerability for relapse. That makes a lot of sense. So where is the field of addiction heading with regard to both treatment and prevention of addiction? I'm the eternal optimist. So I think prevention in the alcohol field, I think we're doing some pretty good stuff. There's been a steady decline in underage drinking in the United States over the last 15 years. Some of that seems to be extending into college drinking and college binge drinking. There's still high levels, even in high school seniors, but we have a steady decline. There's a steady decline in drunk driving in the United States since Reagan signed the 21-year-old drinking law into effect. That's the good news. The bad news is that there's still a good bit of binge drinking and what we call high-intensity drinking, and we need to address that. We've instituted quite a few things in the Institute to get information out to the public and also things like screening and brief intervention. Screening and brief intervention is sometimes just asking two questions from a primary care doc. How much do you drink and how much do your friends drink? And you probably lie, but on the way home, you start thinking, you know, that guy in the white lab coat with the tie on asked me how much I drink. Maybe I am drinking too much. And it actually works. I mean, it's been approved by the U.S. Preventive Health Task Services as an effective prevention mechanism. So we got some of this stuff underway. We need to do more in the level of high schools and middle schools. And we need to do more for this subgroup that gets involved in binge drinking and double or triple binge drinking. From the point of view of treatment, we have three drugs that are approved by the FDA for the treatment of alcohol use disorder, and they are effective. Some people say they're not very effective, but they have the same effect size as fluoxetine or Prozac for the treatment of major depressive disorders. Problem is they're not used. So a big issue that we have today is to get treatment to people and get the healthcare systems to engage individuals in treatment for alcohol use disorders and get primary care docs engaged in referring individuals with an alcohol problem to treatment and then following through with that treatment. We do need new and better and more effective medications. And we have some pretty good behavioral treatments, but we could probably even do better in that domain as well. Can the brain be healed? I know you said that there is loss of neurotransmitters for somebody who has serious alcohol abuse or opiate addiction. Can the brain be reversed back? The answer is yes. The brain can be cured in the sense that it can return to a state of resilience and resistance to relapse. As I said earlier, you don't grow back neurons, but the neurotransmitter systems can calm down. You can develop techniques to keep those systems under control. Cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the behavioral treatments is most effective, has an element in it that involves coping 
mechanisms and reducing stress and reducing vulnerability to stressful situations. That's a major step forward. All those things, exercise, healthy diet, getting behavioral treatment that follows through probably at least for a year, all of those things can contribute to returning your brain to a healthy state. And like I said, if you've been so severe in your alcohol use disorder that you've actually done some physical damage to frontal cortex connection, again, you can strengthen other connections. And that can be done through, again, a whole variety of behavioral treatments from exercise to probably yoga probably helps, although I don't have any data for that, to tune-ups with a therapist or a group or something of that nature. There are millions and millions of people who would probably consider themselves recovered from an alcohol use disorder and leading healthy and, for the most part, probably as best as anybody can determine, happy lives. So what are you most excited about in addiction treatment today? What I'm most excited about is actually my favorite topic, which you heard me already talk about, which is that I think if we put a little more energy into trying to remediate the loss of reward and the increased stress that we associate with the addiction cycle, I think we have an opportunity for medications that will help people along the way. They might even be happy to take them. We've been working in this domain at NIAAA. I have to say, though, if I've been disappointed in one thing, it is very, very difficult to develop medications to treat humans. And it's also extraordinarily expensive. My dream would be that the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry figures out that if we treat alcohol use disorder, we save quadrillions of dollars in healthcare costs. If you talk to any emergency room physician at any medical center in the United States, they will tell you that on Friday or Saturday night, half the people in the emergency room are there because of alcohol. I think we just completely underestimate how much we could save in health and well-being if we treated alcohol use disorders and treated it properly and put energy into finding better treatment. The final piece, though, that's most critical is that treatment is not a 28-day detox facility. Treatment is a long-term process that extends out probably at least a year or two post-detox. And I think our healthcare systems and the public has to understand that treatment of alcohol use disorder and addiction in general is a long-term process prospect, much like treating a major depressive episode. You don't take a person on a major depressive episode, give them 28-day treatment and turn them loose again. They're usually followed up for months and years. They may take an antidepressant for a long period of time, and they're usually followed by a psychiatrist for quite some time or clinical psychologist. The magic wand would be that we start really treating addiction and alcohol use disorder in particular. In other words, that people get initial treatment, but they get the protracted treatment as well. And that can take so many different forms. And by the way, we have a website called the NIAAA Treatment Navigator, and that tells you everything I've been telling you about alcohol use disorder and everything about the different stages and intensity of an alcohol use disorder, but also what kind of treatments are appropriate for those different stages. And even more, perhaps interesting, is on this navigator, you can type in your zip code And it will take you to the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration locator, or to the Psychology Today locator, to a treatment facility that's in your zip code. That was my next question, which is how can my audience learn more about your work, either online or in print? And can you just say the website? It's called the NIAAA Treatment Navigator. And then we have another one. It's called Rethinking Drinking, which tells you about alcohol and what is a standard drink and How much alcohol does it take to get you to a point that's not good? And much of what I've been talking about is on rethinking drinking. And then for those of your individuals who are sending kids to college, we sent this to every college administrator in the United States at every college and university. It's called College AIM. And it's basically a menu of prevention options at colleges and universities for preventing alcohol problems. And while it's mainly for administrators, you can check it out and use it to ask where you're sending Sally or Johnny, what part of College AIM are they using? And there are individual prevention programs like Alcohol EDU on there. That's just one example. And there are community ones like, do they card at sporting events? And do they really card? And so on and so forth. All of those websites will be on the show notes. 
And you can reach them by the NIAAA main website as well. And we are in the process of updating that. So every once in a while, you'll start to see some changes. But we've been in a year-long process of updating all our websites. So Dr. Coop, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you have helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction. Well, you're most welcome. It's been a real pleasure and great questions. Oh, thank you. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health, including a whole page dedicated to Dr. Koob's work. And there you'll also find how to contact me to submit your questions, personal stories, insights about the mental health system, suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. So I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.